Well, I've got mic, the mic on like pastor, so I'm hoping it makes me preach like pastor. Um, I sent him a text and said, can I use your mic? And he's like, well, I guess. So I'm hoping that his anointing will flow out of the earpiece into me this morning. Amen? Um, before we dive in, um, let's pray. Y'all stretch your hands forward and pray for me as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you open our hearts and our spirits to receive the word that you have prepared for us this morning. Dear God, just step me aside, pour through me what you have for your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Melissa Barton wanted me to do a disclaimer real quick. Um, if you have reservations for 1130, you might want to cancel those because she joked with me earlier in the week, so I went back and added eight pages more to my sermon. So we're looking at a good 30, 40 minutes at least, if not variation a little bit back and forth. <laughs> Amen. Certain subjects are of profound interest to thoughtful Christians. Whenever a pastor deals with one of those subjects, he knows that most of the people will be right with him from the very beginning. Those subjects are, can be anything from Bible prophecy, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, marriage or family, or even something about spiritual gifts or spiritual victory. And that's what I'm going to be speaking on today. How to walk in victory in the Christian life. Amen? I think that's one of the biggest places as Christians we struggle. If you doubt whether this is a popular subject, I challenge you to go to any Christian bookstore or secular bookstore for that and see how many books and tapes there are for sale on the general subject of spiritual victory. You will find books and, and tapes out there about the three steps, the four ways, the five secrets, the seven ideas, the eight good things that can lead you to spiritual victory. Radio preachers, the men with the greatest nationwide ministries talk about spiritual victory all the time. If you ever listen to a preacher on the radio, a lot of times that's what they're speaking on is spiritual victory. Amen? They do it for a reason. There is a great hunger and a great desire among the people of God to find a way to live victory in their lives. But behind that hunger is the reality that many believers live spiritually defeated lives. So many Christians go through life struggling day to day, hour to hour, month to month, year to year. So many Christians struggle with the same sin over and over and over again, month after month, year after year. That's why they feel like they never make any progress. Amen? I have a question. Are there any secrets? Are there any secret steps? Are there... Are there any things that we can discover from God's Word that can, that can help us live victoriously this week? I think the answer to that is yes. Amen? Amen? However, there's always a however. <laughs> however, there is a problem with much of the current teaching on victorious living. So much of it tends to go to the extreme. For instance... There's a teaching that says if you want victory, all you need to do is understand that God did it all. They love the slogan, let go, let God. I've used that quite a few times myself. That teaching, which basically has a biblical core to it, if taken to the extreme, will turn you into a passive Christian. Other teachers say, all you have to... You have to do it all. Spiritual victory is 100% on your shoulders. That teaching, which also contains a core of truth, may turn you into a legalist, a rule keeper, a performance addict, and ultimately into an arrogant, proud person with perfectionist tendencies. Some of this is going to be tough. Sorry. Some of it's going to be tough. A third teaching suggests that if you want spiritual victory... You need a crisis experience. Mm -hmm. A crisis experience. Certainly many Christians do come to a moment 
of decisive surrender to God. But if you take that too far, it may turn you into an introvert and somewhat emotional Christian who depends upon an emotional experience. Let me repeat, all three views have some biblical basis. God has done something to make it possible for you to live in victory. Yet there is something you must do. Amen? And most of us will have a very crucial, deeply moving crisis experience with God, which lifts us from one plateau to another. So I think there's truth to all three teachings. But we don't want to go to the extremes. Amen? We want to find a solid biblical balance. In order to do that, we're going to look at the central passage in the New Testament on spiritual victory. It's Romans 6, 1 through 14. I want to take a a minute to make a comment before we jump into this text. The general thrust of, of these verses is very clear. The details of any particular verse may confuse you. But the general flow of Paul's thoughts is not difficult to follow. Rather than spending a lot of time on any one verse, I want to survey the entire section. Taken together, this passage presents a great message from the Apostle Paul about how you can live in spiritual victory. Here's a quote from Charles Erdman. The life of a Christian need not be one of ceaseless conflict. It should be a life of ever more continuous victory. Amen? That sounds good, don't it? I'm all for that. Excuse me, my nose started running. The question is, how do we get from where we are to a life of ever more continuous victory. If there is a way from here to there, it's revealed in Romans 6, 1 through 14. I think we're going to put that up there now. Romans 6, 1 through 14. This is the NIV, I think. Yeah, NIV. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We were those who have died to sin, have come. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. Amen? For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been bought from death to life, And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master. But you because you are not under the law, you are under grace. 
Amen? It's a long passage to read. This passage tells us there's basically three steps for spiritual victory. Romans 6, 3, ask or don't you know? Verse 6 adds, for we know. Verse 9 says, also says, for we know. Spiritual victory begins with someone knowing something. That's the first step. You've got to know something. Step two comes in verse 11 in the, in the same way, count yourselves. I prefer to use the word in the King James Version, um, count your, not count yourselves, but reckon yourselves. Then we come to step three. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin, but rather offer yourselves to God. So step one is no. Step two is reckon. And step three is yield. Amen? We're going to dive real deep into these here in just a second. Everything in this passage fits into one of those three headings. You've got to know something. You've got to reckon something. And you definitely have to yield something. Taken together, they're God's prescription for the believer's walk in victory. So let's dive in. Number one, no. Not no. <laughs> no is in knowledge. If you want victory, you must know certain things. Christian living is always dependent upon Christian learning. Duty follows doctrine. If Satan, if Satan can keep us ignorant, he can keep us impotent. So if you want victory, it's got to start in the mind with knowing certain, certain truths. Verses 1 through 10 tell us that you need to know what you, what you were, what you are, and what you now have. What were you? Crucified with Christ. What were you? Buried with Christ. What were you? Raised with Christ. What were you? United with Christ. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We therefore, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Jesus was raised from the dead the glory, by the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. How many people, here's a, here's a big question, and everybody's going to get it right. How many people were crucified at Calvary? I heard three. Oh, okay. If you said three from a historical point of view, you'd be quite correct. From a theoretical theoretical point of view you'd be wrong most of y'all think of one right I know we're these verses are telling us that if you were a believer in Jesus Christ you were you were there that day you were crucified with Christ you were buried with him you were raised from the dead the cross of Jesus Christ is not an event there is an event that transi- transcends time. It is an event that is so important that it has implications from before the, in- the universe was formed and it stretches all the way to the end of time. Amen? Your spiritual history begins at the cross of Christ. You died with him. You were buried with him. And you were raised from the dead with him. All of that is, a, is symbolized in the act of the believer's baptism. When I baptize somebody, uh, they symbolically portray the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Going old man underwater, new man coming out. Amen? Amen? In the New Testament, the word baptism literally means immerse. Though it has a symbolic meaning. The symbolic meaning 
is wrapped up in the word identification. That's why whenever uh, people are baptized, they're making a public statement, a public identification that they are born again, that Christ lives in their heart. It symbolizes what happens the moment you say yes to Jesus. It happened historically 2,000 years ago. It happened for you the moment you said yes. Amen? Paul says, we died to sin. That's a fact, not an experience. You may say, I don't feel like I was crucified with Christ. Feelings have nothing to do with it. I don't feel like I was raised with Christ. Your feelings have nothing to do with the truth. From God's point of view, he sees you as dead, buried, raised with Jesus. And therefore united with him so tightly that you can never be separated. The basic truth of this passage, what are you? Dead to sin. What are you? Freed from sin. Amen? Paul draws two conclusions from the truth of reunion with Christ. Verse 2 says, we died to sin. And verse 7 says, anyone who has died is free from sin. To be dead to sin means to be freed from the power, the ruining power of sin in your life. Dead to sin doesn't mean that you don't sin. I get really scared when people come up and say, Pastor Kevin, I'm beyond sin. You know, be greater than thou. I'm beyond sin. I get scared of people like that. I back away from people like that. Dead to sin doesn't mean that you never sin again. It doesn't mean freed from the temptation of sin. Although you are dead to sin, sin is not dead to you. What it does mean is although sin is a reality, it no longer has the power to dominate your life. That's what it means to be dead to sin. You are separated from the dominating, ruling power of sin. It's like watching a lion roar at the zoo. I like analogies, people can get it. You're at the zoo, lion's behind the bars, he's roaring. You can enjoy that roar as long as he's behind them bars. Amen? He can't do anything to you when he's behind them bars. Now, unless you do something stupid like crawl inside there, then you're going to have problems. Sorry. Sin is like the roaring lion. As long as you understand that the power of sin is broken, sin cannot dominate your life unless you choose to let it dominate your life. So what you have, you have a brand new life. Amen? What you have, you have a resurrection life. Now if we were, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead he cannot die again death no longer has mastery over him the death he died to sin once and for all but the life he lives he lives to God God did what he did for us in that we may too live a new life the word new life in the Greek. That is an interest, interesting word. It means new of a different kind. New of a different kind. It doesn't mean new in the sense of better. God didn't save you to give you a better life. He didn't save you to give you to, to renovate your old life that you messed up. No. He saved you to give you a brand new life of a completely different kind. Salvation is not 
reformation or renovation. It is not just an improvement over what you used to have. It is the impartation of the divine life of God, which means that you have something now that you never had before. What is it? You have the resurrection life in Jesus Christ. If you have been united with him like this in his death, we, certain, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. You now have the resurrection life of Jesus within you. That's a fact, not an experience. Amen? You may say, I don't feel like I've got a new life. It doesn't matter what you feel on the inside. We all go up and down emotionally. Amen? Some more than others. Amen? <laughs> if you are a believer, then God has given you a brand new life. The resurrection life of His Son, Jesus. It is a fact, not an experience. True spirituality begins with a proper understanding of what God has done for you. If you don't understand what God has done for you, steps two and three aren't going to work in your life. It all begins with understanding what God did in your life the moment you trusted Christ. He gave you a brand new life. A, a trans, he transferred you from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. But how do you make it real? How do you make it real on a day-to-day -day basis? All this truth, all this head knowledge, how do you make it real? Step two. Reckon. Not reckon Ralph. Reckon. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. You have to reckon or consider or count that everything I just said is actually true. Huh. Dead to sin, but alive to God. It's basically a summary of, this, of what he said in the first ten verses. If you don't understand anything about the baptism, the old man... Uh, being dead to sin, freed from sin. Just focus on this one phrase. Dead to sin, but alive to God. You were dead to sin, but now through Jesus Christ you are alive to God. In place of count or consider, I've used the old word reckon. But that might be misleading to some people. You know, down south we use reckon a lot. You know, um, to mean... I reckon maybe I will, maybe I won't. Or as, I reckon I'll come by and see you, that means I'm supposed to, I'm coming, but I'm not really sure. Amen? There's an element of conditionality in, the, in that word. But, that mean, but the meaning in English has nothing to do with the meaning in Greek. The Greek word is a term from banking. There's some accountants in here, I'm sure. It means to credit money to a particular account. It means that when you deposit $1,000 in your bank account, it gets credited to your account. Therefore, when you write a check for $500, you don't have to worry about it because you are reckoning on the fact that your money is actually in your account. Right? Right? Or you bounce those rubber checks. And then you get the $35 bounce check ticket. Amen. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Reckoning means to count on the fact that God has actually done what he said he would do. It means to count on the fact that if God said it, he meant it, and therefore he did it. Amen. It means to live on the basis of the fact that God wasn't kidding when he said he would do this, therefore he did it. And therefore you can count on it. Reckoning is not claiming a promise, but acting upon a fact. It's not make-believe. 
It's not getting yourself worked up into an emotional tizzy or pretending something is true that you know is not true. It is believing that what God has said He would do, He really did do. Therefore, it is really true. Therefore, you can depend on it. Therefore, you can stake life upon it. Therefore, it's an actual fact. What does this mean spiritually? Everybody in here, everybody on planet Earth, everybody by nature is born into this kingdom of sin, the kingdom of Satan. You were born here and you're going to live here all your life until you accept Christ. Until you come to Christ. When you say yes to Jesus, you are transferred from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Once you lived for sin, now you've been transferred into the kingdom of God. Now you have a new king. You have a new master. You have a new lord. I like this one the most. You have a new citizenship. We hear a lot about that in the news today. We have a new citizenship. We have a new way of looking at things. And this one's a little, little hard. You have new boundaries for your conduct. It's kind of tough. You have been changed. You have been transferred. You were living one life, now you've been given a brand new life. Transferred to a brand new realm. I like that one too. To reckon means to count. To count on the fact that those things really are true. It means basically the whole story of your life, of your life, is two parts. You have your B.C. and your A.D. Before Christ, after deliverance. Amen? The whole story of your life can be written in two volumes. Not a whole lot to write about, huh? Two volumes. One would be called, What I Was Like Before I Knew Jesus. Number two is, What My Life Looks Like Since Christ Came In. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all are going to get these. Some of y'all, it's way over your head. It's like those ads you used to see for Jenny Craig. I used to weigh 450 pounds, and I called Jenny Craig. Now I weigh 98 pounds, dripping wet. Right? Or here's an even older one. I used to be a 98-pound weakling. Then I signed up for Charles Atlas. And now I'm a muscle man. <laughs> that one was even older than me, but it was funny. <laughs> to reckon means to understand that your life has a before and an after. Amen? A before and an after. There's always a before and an after. If you're still in your before, there's always the promise of the after. Amen? Amen? If you're in your after, there's always the promise of spiritual victory. I have a really cool story that I come upon I want to read you. It's titled, 37 Years in the Jungle. In 1982, an unusual thing happened on the island of Guam. A Japanese soldier came out of the jungle. He had been living in the jungle for 30 Seven years since the end of World War II. Why? That's what I thought. You know, what the world, you know? Be like living in the trees. I guess I don't know. Because when the news came that the war had ended, he couldn't believe that Japan had surrendered and the war was over. So for 37 years, he lived in the jungle. 
Let me ask you a question. During those 37 years, was he free? Yes. Yes, he was. At any time from 1945 until 1982, he was completely free to come out of the jungle. It isn't like General MacArthur was coming in to get him. He was free. He could come out in the 50s. He could come out in the 60s. He was completely free on a theological basis. But because he didn't believe it, because he didn't believe it, because he didn't reckon the fact of his freedom to be true, he lived in self-imposed bondage in the jungle for 37 years. Was he free? Yes. But was he free? No. Because he chose to stay in bondage, in hiding, and in fear in the jungle. Many Christians are still living in the jungle of sin. Amen? The war is over. Christ has won. But they refuse to believe it. They live in self-imposed bondage to sin. They are still in the jungle spiritually because they refuse to believe that Christ has set them free. Sorry. Pulling off. Here's another one. A tale of a, a defeated tyrant. Once upon a time, a mighty, terrible tyrant ruled the land. So terrible and so powerful was he that all the people cowered before him. They hated him fiercely. But he was so powerful, they could do nothing about it. He was a cruel, a cruel vindictive taskmaster who abused everyone without exception. He took their money. He corrupted their morals. He was evil through and through. Does anybody know anybody like that? Don't say yes. One day a man was, was riding along on a white horse, and he came into this town. He challenged the tyrant to do battle. The tyrant thought it was a big joke and laughed. But when the battle was over, the stranger on the white horse had won. The tyrant was thrown in prison. When the victory was announced, a strange silence fell across the land. The people had lived in bondage so long they couldn't quite believe the good news. Every time they ventured outside, they got scared and returned to their homes. After all, the tyrant was not destroyed, but just locked away. From time to time, they even heard his wild screams and wondered if he would ever escape. If only they had known the tyrant was locked up forever and could never get out but they knew it not. Life didn't change much. They were so fearful of the tyrant that even after the battle was over and the victory declared, they still lived in object fear. Were they free? Yes. The man on the white horse had won the battle. The tyrant was in prison. But were they free? No. Because they did not believe it in their hearts. No, because they, they didn't have faith that he was locked up. They continued in fearful slavery to the de defeated tyrant because they did not reckon the victory to be true. If they, if they had ever had enough courage to believe it in their hearts that it was actually true, their lives would reflect it. 
the freedom they it would reflect the freedom that they already had. But instead, they continued living in their own bondage. Has anybody in here ever listened to like KMOC preachers that preach on? I do it all the time. I don't ever say this guy's name now. It's Luis Palau, I think is how you say his last name. No. Luis Palau. <laughs> My wife trying to correct me over here. You hear that? <laughs> oh, come on, Lloyd. Yesterday, I was riding around the truck. It's actually Friday. I was riding around in the truck, and I was listening to Luis, the famous Latin American evangelist. He was born in Argentina. But in his message, he kept emphasizing his American citizenship. There's that word again, citizenship. I was born in Argentina, but now I am an American citizen. He said it three times. And then he pulled out his passport as if we were doubting his words. He opened it and said, see, it says, U.S. citizen, Luis Palau. I am a citizen of the United States. I was born in Argentina and once was a citizen of that country. But now I am a citizen of the United States of America. He said, when I went before the judge in San Francisco, he said to me, sir, do you renounce the government and the flag of Argentina? I said, yes, yes, sir, I do. The man said, do you swear allegiance and loyalty to the United States of America? I said, yes, yes, sir, I do. Then Louis said, if I go back to Argentina, I don't go back as a citizen. I go back as a visitor because I'm not a citizen of that country anymore. I am a citizen of the United States of America. The same is true for you and me. If you know Jesus Christ, you're not a citizen of this world anymore. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. The moment you said yes to Christ, God gave you a, a brand new passport, and it's got a stamp on it that says kingdom of heaven. Amen? That's the great defining spiritual truth. You can't go back anymore. You cannot pretend that you're still a citizen of this world you have, you've got to reckon yourself. You've got to count yourself. You've got to consider yourself transferred by God from one kingdom to another. You can't live the way you used to live because you're not the person you used to be. Amen? You've been changed. You've been transformed. Your citizenship has been transferred to the kingdom, from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of heaven. Amen? The moment you said yes. And that brings us to number three. Yield. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so you obey its evil desires. But offer the parts of your body to sin as an instrument of wickedness. But rather, offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master. But you are, because you are not under the law, you are under grace. I want to repeat that again. Sin will no longer be your master. Sin will no longer have a hold on you. Because you're not under the law of sin anymore. We are under the, the, the law of grace. Under God's amazing grace. So step number one is no. Step number two is reckon. Step number three comes in light of number one and number two. Yield. 
Paul says it negatively and positively. He says, don't yield, and then yield. It's kind of confusing. Don't yield over here, yield over here. Don't do, don't do. Don't yield, don't yield what? The parts of your body. Yield what? The parts of your body. It's kind of confusing. What are the parts of your body? Your hands, your fingers, your eyes, your ears, your toes, your legs, your mouth, everything in between, right? He is very specific about it. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as an instrument of wickedness. The word instrument really means weapon. Don't offer the parts of your body as a weapon don't offer the parts of your body as a weapon of wickedness, but rather yield yourself to God as to who, those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to God as a weapon, as weapons to righteousness. So your body and everything in it and on it and around it is a weapon. Amen? It's either a weapon for God or against God. You're either fighting the victorious fight or you're fighting against the victorious fight. Amen? That's why it says you have to yield your body. You have to yield everything about you to God. There are two facts about this yielding. Number one, it must be decisive. By decisive, I mean that you've got to come to a place in your life where you decide that you're going to be God's man or God's woman. Wherever you go. Not just today or Wednesday. Everywhere you go. Too many of us are living partly in the world and partly in the kingdom of heaven. I see Facebooks, chat, Snapchat, Twitters. You can't do that. You can't do that and be successful and happy in the Christian life. You can do it if you want to be miserable and you, if you want to continually struggle. But if you want to live truly successful and happy in the Christian life, you have to yield. You'll never know victory if you try to live in both worlds. The way to spiritual victory is to understand that you are now God's man or woman, and you must now live for Him. Number two, this yielding must be definite. Romans 12, 1 says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. What are you to offer to God? Your physical body. Why does God want your body? He's perfect. Why does he need us? Why does he want your body? Because if God's got your body, he's got you. Wherever your body goes, you soon have to follow with it, right? <laughs> if God's got your body, he's got you. If you're totally yielded to God, God has got you completely. Amen? And the battle is on. There's a constant roaring battle. The other day, one of the members of our church said to me, Pastor Kevin, we need more teaching in this church on spiritual warfare. Look at what is happening in our world around us. Look at the decline of Wichita Falls and all the small little cities and towns around us. Look at the decline of America today. There's a war going on, and our people have got to understand that. And I think she's right. There is a war going on. 
A war between the, the forces of good and the forces of evil. A war between Satan and God. A war between the kingdom of evil and the kingdom of righteousness. You see it every day. God is looking for some people who will sign up to be in, in His army. But here's some awesome truth. Satan and God are battling for you. Satan would love to sign you up for his evil empire. Darth Vader, he wants to sign you up. Bad one them. <laughs> Just the way it is. God is looking for some people who will sign up for his army. Amen. God, through his Holy Spirit, while this is all going on, is saying, No, don't do it. Don't sign on that line. No. The Holy Spirit is whispering in your spirit the whole time. Don't do it. No. No. You are my child. No. I want you to sign up in the army of God, not the evil empire. Have you ever thought of it that way? I'm a little different. Okay, you know. God has no lips except your lips yielded to Him. God has no eyes except your eyes yielded to Him. He has no ears except your ears yielded to Him. He has no hands except your hands yielded to Him. He has no feet except your feet offered to Him. Spiritual victory will never be real until you make it particular and definite regarding the parts of your body. Let's talk about your eyes. Everybody has eyes? Everybody can see? Some better than others. Have you been looking at things this week that you shouldn't have? Let's talk about your, uh, your ears. Have you been listening to gossip, slander, filth talk, coarse humor? Let's talk about your lips. Have you used your lips this week for swearing, for anger, for bitterness? Are your lips yielded to God? What about your hands? Are your hands yielded to God? Or do you constantly use them to grasp more of the goods of this world? What about your feet? Are your feet yielded to God? Or are they constantly taking you places that you shouldn't go? What about the most intimate parts of your body? Are those parts yielded to God or are you using them for evil? Spiritual victory isn't going to happen until you make it very personal. How personal? Yield your body to God. I challenge you. Yield your body to God. challenge you to check those areas in your life that may need to be yielded. I went really fast because I'm almost at the end. You could have kept your 1130 reservation. I'm sorry. Um, I want, if the band could come back up, make their, start making their way back up. I always talk faster when there's a lot of people looking at me. In just a few moments, in a few moments after the band's up and I finish closing, the altars are going to be open. And our prayer team is going to be up here to pray with you. And I want you to search your heart and be sensitive to the Spirit about what needs to be yielded today.
Today, do your lips need to be yielded? How about your eyes? How about your ears? Your mind? Your hands? Your feet? Your heart? Your intimate parts? If you want victory, you can have it. Amen? You have to know something. You have to reckon something. And then you've got to get serious. You've got to yield the particular parts of your body for the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would y'all stand with me, please? Not totally done. Just warming y'all up. <laughs> When your lips become his, when your eyes become his, when your ears, your hands, your feet all become his, you know what's going to happen? You'll be his. Amen? You'll be his wherever you go. And you will know spiritual victory. It is possible to live without the chaos. It is possible to live without the anxiety. It is possible to live without the depression or the addiction or whatever it may be in your life. It is possible because Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross sin has no power over us anymore. Amen? It is possible if you reckon that it's true. It's a mind frame and a heart thing. You have to know that you know that you know that it's 100% true and you have to believe it with every fiber of your being. It is possible because God has made it possible. Not because we make it possible. Too many of us try to fight this fight on our own. But we forget that we have to yield to the Creator who won the battle. We can't live as the people from the, de the defeated tyrant for year after year after year already knowing that the battle is won. We can't live in the jungle our entire life when the battle's already been won just because we don't believe that it's won. It is possible. God has made it possible. But now you've got to get serious. You have to search your heart and mind to what needs to be yielded to God. All the parts of your body. Not just, I'm going to yield this part over here, but I'm really strong with this arm. This is my arm. This is mine. I work out with this arm. He can have this one. I don't do nothing with it. I'll yield this one, but I, I think I can win the battle with this one. That's not what it says. It doesn't say you work your legs out. You've got great big old legs. You can squat 1,000 pounds, so you keep the bottom half, and I'll take the top. That's not what it says. It says yield all of the parts of your body. That's even down to like your fingernails and your eyelids. That's all your parts of your body. Right? When you do that, you will know lasting and true spiritual victory. So today, as we get ready to close and open these altars, I know everyone in here is fighting a battle. Because the world and Satan wants you bad. He wants to take you down. Whether you're B.C. or A.D. He wants you. 
If, he's, if you're BC, before Christ, he wants to keep you. If you're AD, after deliverance, he wants to defeat you and keep you ignorant and impotent and weak. Every day, this battle is raging over your head. We don't even fathom it. It's right here. God is at war for you and me. He is fighting everything he can to keep you safe. And we like to say, oh, it's coincidence. Oh, it's karma. Karma. Yeah. No, it's God. God's grace and mercy flowing over you day in and day out to keep you where you are every day. So search your heart. Yield your body to God today. Walk in spiritual victory tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. It is possible because God made it possible. Prayer team, would y'all please come up front? Those that are prayers, come up front. transition into this moment my heart is heavy I was preparing for this message I thought oh this will be a pretty easy message to prepare for everybody talks about wanting to be victorious you know everybody wants a victorious spiritual life spiritual walk but as I was praying and as I was getting ready for this and I was asking God what am I going to say? What is going to make an impact? What, you know, what? It's been talked about a billion times. He started laying on me a feeling of the battle that people are fighting in their lives day in and day out. And as I was in my office praying and weeping and crying because some people are fighting battles that no one even knows about, and they're hidden in their closet. And they're defeated because they don't want to come out. But God is telling me to tell you today, it's already won. The victory is already there. It's already been paid. Yield yourself to the Lord. Yield yourself to the Lord in every way today. Bow your heads. I'm going to pray altars are going to be open. And I challenge everyone in here, search your heart. What do you need to yield to the Lord today? Lord, some of us would like to talk about victory, but we don't want to talk about our hands or our feet or our lips or our eyes. We want victory, but we don't want to yield anything to you. Help us to be specific, definite, and decisive. May we yield all to you. May we become men and women of God so that through us, so that through us, you can minister your healing grace to a world in need. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. The altars are now open. If you need to yield something today, come forward. If you need healing today, whatever your fight is, the Holy Spirit is here to fight with you. If you don't want to come along, grab someone by the hand. Come get some prayer today.
We're going to let these pray as long as they want to. If you still need prayer, the altar's open and we will stay as long as we need to. Y'all are dismissed. Visit out in the, in the foyer. Y'all have a blessed and wonderful Labor Day.